Hi everybody, welcome to your first biochemistry lecture video. Um, in this unit, chapter one, the introduction to the chemistry of life, we're sort of providing a nice review of a number of different concepts such as functional groups from organic chemistry, uh, components of the cell from cell molecule, and then thermodynamics from general chemistry. We'll then take kind of everything that we've discussed in the lecture video and then apply it to our first in-class activity from our Hogel workbook. So this is activity 22, understanding complex chemical systems in living organisms. This activity is gonna give us an opportunity to apply thermodynamic concepts to biological systems, as well as give us some practice in distinguishing between the terms equilibrium and steady state, and then use them appropriately to describe biochemical systems. So keep that in mind as we're navigating through the lecture material and as you're reading through the chapter. Um, to sort of kind of help you navigate that material, I'm also providing you guys with this worksheet, um, the reading log, which kind of gives you an opportunity to summarize learning objectives, um, write down any vocabulary terms that you're not quite familiar with, as well as give you a place to kind of jot notes and questions. So speaking of questions, don't forget to post your muddiest point questions on the Moodle discussion board for this lecture. Um, and then try to address one other student's question. I will then take all of these questions that you post and try to create a five to 10 minute little mini lecture that can kind of help clarify any struggles that we're having with the material. And then we'll delve right into our in-class activity. All right, so I will see y'all in class. A cell is a pretty complex system comprised of a variety of different molecules. For instance, we saw a large variety of proteins that took on either globular or fibrous structures or even contained a combination of the two. We saw that these proteins can all have different functions from enzymes to transporters and structural proteins. We also saw that proteins can polymerize, forming larger, more complex structures from the aggregation of smaller components. We saw that some proteins were free-floating in the cytoplasm or could be bound to a membrane. But what you might, or hopefully should, be asking you yourselves right now is how the heck do these proteins, A, know how to fold up the way that they do, and B, know how to function the way that they do? Well, let's zoom into a protein, such as the motor protein kinesin, that we saw carrying vesicles by walking down the high wire that was the microtubule cytoskeleton of the cell in the video. As you can see here, this protein is derived from a number of different structures. At the tail, which holds the vesicle, we have two globular regions connected to another two globular regions, the head, by two twisted helices. How and why this protein folds into this unique structure is governed by the sequence in which amino acids, the building block of proteins, are connected. As you can see here, the primary sequence or the amino acid sequence of kinesin is quite large, but can be subdivided into the regions in which the substructures or secondary and tertiary structures are formed. Okay, great. Now you may be asking yourself, so how is it that the amino acid sequence drives a helical structure as seen in the stalk versus the globular structure as seen in the head or the tail? Well, those interactions are governed by the various functional groups found on the amino acid that define what the amino acid is. And not only do these various functional groups, which if you remember we discussed extensively in organic chemistry, govern macromolecule structure, they are also often the sites of intra and intermolecular non-covalent interactions and are also where organic reactions are governed through enzymes which occur in cellular metabolism. For instance, let's look even closer and zoom in into one of the globular head regions of the kinesin. Now remember, this is the region that binds to the microtubule and walks sort of like feet down the microtubule. These feet actually have to bind and cleave ATP in order to generate the energy that kinesin needs to walk down the microtubule. 
So in a study by a group at Indiana University, scientists discovered that if you mutated certain amino acid residues in the head region of kinesin, you could render this enzyme ineffective or increase its efficiency. This is because certain functional groups on the amino acid side chains play pivotal roles in structure and or function of kinesin. For instance, when the group mutated residue 246, which is found somewhere between the AT binding and microtubular binding domain, from native serine to phenylalanine, they ended up replacing a polar hydroxyl group from serine with a nonpolar bulky aromatic residue on phenylalanine. This in turn reduced kinesin's ability to release the once bound and cleaved ATP from its active site and deactivated or disabled kinesin from walking. Now, when the group mutated residue 227, which is near the microtubular binding surface of kinesin from theanine to methionine, they replaced a smaller polar group with a longer sulfur-containing AKIL chain. This mutation inhibited kinesin from binding to the microtubule, but it was still able to bind and cleave ATP, but since it couldn't bind to the microtubule, it again could no longer walk. In contrast, mutating residue 164, which is actually far from either the AT binding pocket or the microtubule binding domain, from glutamic acid to lysine, actually caused kinesin to bind ATP tighter. The authors believe that replacing the negatively charged carboxylic acid residue of glutamic acid with the positively charged amino group on lysine allowed lysine to create an ionic bridge with a neighboring helix, thus stabilizing the ATP bound structure and preventing ATP release. So as you saw on the previous slides, cells are comprised of a myriad of macromolecules, which are then comprised of a string of smaller molecules, such as amino acids and proteins. And these smaller molecules are comprised of elements covalently bound together. What is surprising to most is that all of these very different components of the cell are all made up of just a few elements. Really, the bulk of organic material that is required for life only utilizes 11% of the naturally occurring elements that we find in the periodic table. And really, the bulk of that material is made up of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, calcium, and phosphate, with smaller amounts of potassium, sulfur, chloride, sodium, and magnesium. How the elements found in the previous slide are bound together is what creates functional groups and gives a molecule certain physical properties such as polarity, formal charge, hydrogen bond donating capabilities or hydrogen bond accepting capabilities or electron donating or withdrawing properties. These functional groups can then interact with other functional groups, either through covalent interactions to form linkages, such as disulfide bridges, or through non-covalent interactions. Often in the cell, we see that non-covalent interactions, such as ionic bonding of this carboxylate group and amino group from two different molecules, can cause dimerization, folding, or polymerization, as we saw in the microtubule assembly in the video. As mentioned before, functional groups also provide sites for organic reactions, such as condensation reactions between a carboxylic acid and an amine to remove a water molecule and covalently link the two molecules together. Or the reverse hydrolysis reaction, where a water is used to break a covalent bond. Indeed, it is through these condensation reactions that we can build proteins out of amino acids or nucleic acids out of nucleotides. We can then also degrade proteins to break them back down into their amino acid components, the same with nucleic acids back into nucleotides. It is even through functional groups of nucleotides that we get intramolecular complementary relationships where guanine based pairs with cytosine and adenine based pairs with thiamine through specific hydrogen bonds. Because of this unique property of DNA, we are able to accurately replicate our chromosomes to pass on our genetic material or that we can translate that genetic material to make proteins. 
As you recall from the video, the eukaryotic cell is a complex structure with a number of different organelles that all play a different role in the survival and function of the cell. As we continue through the course, it is important that you re-familiarize yourself with the function and role of these organelles as specific reactions occur in different regions. But I will try to do my best to point out when certain metabolic processes cross over these various membranes as we go along. Thermodynamics is defined as the study of energy, and all life must obey the laws of thermodynamics. One, energy can neither be destroyed nor created. Two, the entropy of an isolated system not in equilibrium will tend to increase over time, approaching maximum value at equilibrium. And three, as temperature approaches absolute zero, the entropy of a system approaches a constant minimum. Understanding the thermodynamics and how they apply to living system allows us as biochemists to understand and describe processes such as biochemical reactions in terms that can be quantified. And then that allows us to predict whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. In mathematical terms, if the change in free energy, delta G, is negative, then a reaction is spontaneous and will freely occur. However, if delta G is positive, then energy is required for the reaction to occur and is therefore non-spontaneous. If delta G is zero, then the reaction is said to be in equilibrium and occurs in both the forward and reverse direction. As you will see throughout the semester, most of the reactions that we study tend to occur at a delta G near zero, while certain key steps have a very large negative delta G, which then forces the entire metabolic process to occur in the forward direction. Now, predicting whether a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous is dependent on both the change in enthalpy, delta H, and the change in entropy, delta S, at a certain temperature. In most of our processes, we will assume that the temperature is 37 degrees C, or 298 Kelvin, which is body temperature. Enthalpy is a state function that in systems governed by constant volume and pressure, as we see in the cell, can tell us the amount of energy as heat that is absorbed from or released into the surroundings during a reaction. For reactions that are endothermic, heat or energy is absorbed from the surroundings meaning the reactants are at a lower energy state than the products and the reaction is therefore enthalpically unfavorable. In contrast, reactions that release heat or energy into the surroundings are considered exothermic and therefore enthalpically favorable. Remember that the total change in free energy of a system is also dependent on another state function, entropy, which is defined as the degree of randomness of a system. Under the conditions of constant volume and constant pressure, we see that an increase in entropy is favorable, while a decrease in overall entropy is unfavorable. We can see how both changes in enthalpy and entropy can affect the relative value of free energy. For instance, if a reaction is both exothermic and increases in entropy, the reaction is always favorable and spontaneous because mathematically delta G is always negative. Conversely, if a reaction is endothermic and decreases in entropy, then the reaction is always non-spontaneous because delta G is always positive. Now, when we have cases in which the reaction is exothermic but decreases in enthalpy, then the spontaneity of the reaction is dependent on temperature, where at temperatures below the ratio of delta H over delta S, the reaction is spontaneous. If a reaction is endothermic but increases in entropy, then the reaction is only spontaneous at temperatures above the ratio of delta H over delta S. As you recall from earlier, only a handful of reactions in the cell actually occur at very large changes of delta G. 
the majority of the reactions of the cell actually occur at or near equilibrium and at varying degrees of entropy and enthalpy. How do we then predict spontaneity of a reaction if delta G is zero? Well, when the overall change in the free energy is near zero, or when we are at equilibrium, we can then solve for the standard change in free energy, which is delta G naught, based on the relative concentration of reactants and products present in the system. As you can see, delta G naught is related to the equilibrium constant by RT ln KEQ. Therefore, the direction or spontaneity of reactions at equilibrium are dependent on temperature and the relative concentration of products and reactants. As we consider living systems, one of the first things we recognize are that living systems are innately organized. But because living systems such as cells are actually open systems, meaning energy is transferred into and out of the surroundings, then we can still abide by the second law of thermodynamics by increasing the overall disorder of our living system's surroundings. In other words, the total energy of a system plus its surroundings must be considered when we are calculating the delta S of an open system, which you will see come into play again and again in biochemical reactions of the cell later on this course. As we look at living organisms as open systems, we also see how the first law of thermodynamics is maintained from analysis of how energy flows into an open system as radiant energy from the sun, through the system via photosynthesis to make carbohydrates, which are consumed by animals, and out of the system by heat dissipation or loss or by decay of an animal. Even when a system that is not at equilibrium Matter and energy flow according to the laws of thermodynamics, such as we see in steady state systems, where all flows in the system are constant so that the system does not change with time. Being in a steady state allows slight perturbations to correct themselves by changing the flows to restore the steady state. In all living systems, energy flow is downhill, meaning delta G is negative. Once the total delta G of a living system reaches zero, that organism is no longer flowing energy through it and is no longer part of the steady state flow and is therefore by definition dead. So this is where we see the difference between steady state and equilibrium. So now that we've finished all the material for this first unit, um, please take a moment and read over chapter one so that you can fully understand the objectives and go back over the objectives and maybe write the answers out so that you know you are prepared for the exam.